Um, my name is Vishnu, I'm a PhD student at McGill. I'm going to be presenting our work, One Dollar Each Eliminates Envy. This is joint work with my advisor, Adrian Better, and three other grad students uh, here at McGill, Johannes, Jack, and Marshbar. So I'll begin with an introduction to fair division. You may have seen this already. In the fair division with indivisible items problem, the goal is to divide a collection of items amongst a set of agents in a fair manner. So let's break this down. Uh, there's a set J of M items labeled one to M. There's a set I of N agents labeled one to N. And every agent I has a valuation function VI over subsets of the items. So if agent I gets a set S of items, then agent I gets value VI of S for that set. We make some standard assumptions on the VIs. Uh, the first is that VI of the empty set is zero and VI is monotonically increasing. And the second standard assumption, which is standard for this particular problem, is that the marginal value of each item J is at most one. And we can assume this uh, without loss of generality because we can simply scale any agent's valuation function down uniformly until this is true. And that doesn't change any of the uh, NB properties. And uh, then the main question with fair division is what does it mean for an allocation to be fair? So the central fairness notion in economics is NB freeness. An allocation is NB free if each agent values its own bundle, at least as much as that agent values any other agent's bundle. So no agent has NB for some other agent. Unfortunately for indivisible items, uh, envy freeness cannot always be achieved. It's easy to see because, for example, if you have fewer items than agents, then in every allocation, there is an agent that does not receive an item. So that agent is going to envy some other agent that does receive an item. In order to try to circumvent this, in classical work in 1987, Maskin asked, is it possible to always find an envy free allocation of the items with money? And if so, how much money is needed to eradicate all envy? So suppose you have an instance of fair division with indivisible items with no NB free allocation. Then is it possible to add an extra divisible item akin to money such that you can now partition the, uh, the items among the agents and also partition the money and allocate the money in some way so that you now have an NB free allocation of items plus money. Specifically, Maskin looked at the N item unit demand case. So there's only one item per agent. And uh, when the value of an item is at most $1 to any agent, Maskin showed that First, that an envy freeable allocation always exists. So an allocation which can be made envy free with the addition of some money for all of the agents, an external subsidy. Um, and that a subsidy, which is the sum of payments to all the agents, of at most n minus one dollars, so a subsidy of n minus one dollars is always sufficient to eradicate envy. Uh, the same problem was many variations of this were studied, uh, but they all considered only the n item unit demand case. But after the year 2000, interest in uh, fair division with indivisible items sort of shifted towards showing uh, relaxed fairness guarantees like EF1 and alpha MMS. So it is only very recently that the natural next question, which is what about the general M item multi-demand setting when an agent can receive, this is, this is the general fair division problem. It was only recently this, that this was considered. Specifically only last year did Halpern and Shah consider this problem. And they showed that an envy freeable allocation always exists, even in the M item multi-demand setting. Let's look at an example to see why some allocations are envy-freeable and others are not envy-freeable. So in this example, you have two items, one and two, two agents, Alice and Bob, and they have added evaluation functions given in the table. So for example, if Alice gets item one and two, then Alice gets a total value of three plus five, so eight dollars for that bundle. And now let's look at some allocations for this instance. Um, in the first allocation, Alice gets both items and Bob gets nothing. So now Alice has a total value of eight. Bob has a, a total value of 13 for Alice's bundle. So in order to eliminate Bob's envy, we need to give Bob $13. But now Alice envies Bob's bundle by $5 because Bob gets no items, but gets $13. But Alice envies her items at just $8. So you need to give $5 to Alice to eliminate her envy and you're stuck in the cycle. So this is not an envy freeable allocation. Similarly, if Alice gets um, item one, Bob gets item two, Bob doesn't envy Alice, but Alice envies Bob by $2 because Alice has a value of five for item two. But if you give Alice $2, Bob now has a value of six plus two for Alice's bundle and Bob envies Alice. Again, you're stuck. But in the allocation where Alice gets item two and Bob gets item one, uh, now Alice does not envy Bob because Alice values her own bundle at five. Bob envies Alice by just $1. So if you give Bob $1, Alice still doesn't envy Bob because Alice has a value of three plus one dollar. So this is an envy freeable allocation. Specifically, the allocation where Alice gets item two and Bob gets item one plus a dollar is envy free. So Halpern and Shah showed that there always exists some envy free, envy freeable allocation, such as this one, where Alice gets two and Bob gets one in every instance. They also gave an upper bound on the total subsidy that is sufficient for additive agents. So if the agents have additive valuation functions, um, they showed that for any envy freeable allocation, 
the minimum subsidy required is at most n minus one times m. So the number of agents minus one times the number of items. And they conjectured based on experiments for the F, that for all additive valuations, uh, this can be dramatically improved. So the first conjecture is that a subsidy of just n minus one dollars is sufficient for energy freeness. Uh, so this entirely gets rid of the dependence on the number of items. And also, if the first conjecture is true, then it is tight because uh, in the example where one a there's a single item and you give it to some agent, then the other n minus one agents need to be given a dollar. So if this is true, then it's tight. They also conjecture that there's always some allocation that is simultaneously NB freeable and EF1. So an allocation is EF1 if for any pair of agents I and K, uh, there's some item in K is bundled such that if you remove that item, I no longer NB is K. All right, of course, we, in this work, we're gonna resolve both of these conjectures and we're gonna go a bit further. So before we do that, we need some definitions. An allocation with payments AP is NB free, as we saw before. If for every ordered pair of agents, VI of AI plus PI is at least VI of AK plus PK. So agent I prefers its own bundle plus payment to agent K's bundle plus payment. So agent I has no NB for agent K. And also the subsidy of an allocation is simply the sum of the payments to all the agents, where the payments are non-negative. Um, so our goal is to study the structure of these and free allocations with payments. And the first thing you may think to do is to pose this as a subsidy minimization problem subject to NB constraints. But if you do this, um, you don't get very far because it's NP hard to compute the minimum subsidy. It's even NP hard to find a multiplicative approximation to the minimum subsidy because it's NP hard to differentiate between uh, cases, instances which have an NB free allocation and instances which don't. But there's a really nice graph characterization that can help us. The NV graph of an allocation, A, we're gonna call the NV graph GA, is a complete directed graph on vertex set I. So the vertices are the set of agents, and the weight on an arc IK is the NV that agent I has for agent K. So the weight of IK is simply agent I's value for K's bundle minus agent I's value for its own bundle, which is its NV for agent K. Now, Halpern and Shaw obtained this characterization, which is the generalization of an earlier result by Argonis. This says that an allocation is NV freeable if and only if this NV graph has no positive weight detected cycle. I'm not going to prove this theorem, but I will uh, explain some of the implications. So if the NV graph has no positive weight directed cycles, then starting at every vertex, there is a, a well-defined heaviest path. This is akin to um, the opposite case. You should be familiar with this. If, if an NV graph has no negative, I mean, if any graph has no negative weight cycles, then there's a well-defined shortest path, right? So similar to that, if you just take the negation of every edge weight, you just get that if, if the NV graph has no positive weight directed cycle, then there's a, there's a heaviest, well-defined heaviest path starting at every vertex. So to obtain a feasible payment vector to eliminate NV, given an NV freeable allocation, all you need to do is compute the heaviest path starting at each agent in this um, uh, graph. And the weight of the heaviest path in GA lower bounds the payment to each agent. So Halpern and Shaw also show, also show that this is the best you can do in terms of subsidy, is compute the heaviest path from each agent. Um, I want you to note that at this point that um, if a graph has no positive weight directed cycle, then there's some vertex that has no uh, positive weight path leaving that vertex. Otherwise, you cannot have this property, right? So there's some vertex that's going to get a payment of zero, some agent that's going to get a payment of zero in the minimum subsidy. All right. So with that previous result, we can now prove uh, this, this theorem. It basically just falls out that for an NV freeable allocation, the minimum subsidy is at most n minus one times m. This is Halpern and Charles earlier theorem. It suffices to show that the weight of any path is at most m. So since each item appears at most once on any path, the weight of a path is simply the sum of NVs on the path, which is at most the sum of bundle valuations. And since each item has a value of at most one and there are m items, this is at most m. For an arbitrary allocation, this bound is tight. So you cannot do better than n minus one times m. So in order to show the conjecture, our goal is to find a specific n freeable allocation for every instance and show that for this specific allocation, the subsidy is at most n minus one. Um, recall that these are the conjectures. So we're going to show that for additive valuations, as was conjectured, there is a polytime algorithm that finds an NV and EF1 allocation. This is also conjecture two. And that same allocation also has a minimum subsidy of at most N minus one, resolving conjecture one. And in fact, we're showing something slightly stronger, which is that the minimum subsidy is at most $1 for each agent in that same allocation. Then separately, we're also considering the much broader class of general monotone valuations. And we're gonna show that there's an allocation of subsidy is O of N squared. So again, surprisingly, this is independent of the number of items. So no matter how many items you have, uh, you can always find an NV free allocation with the addition of just tiny amount of money. 
Our algorithm for the additive case is incredibly simple. All it does is in each round, it computes a maximum weight matching between the agents and the unallocated items and allocates one item to each agent. So in this example, there are two agents, one and two, there's five items. Agent one is red, agent two is blue, and here are the values, right? So we first add a dummy item to make the number of items a multiple of the number of agents. Uh, everybody has value zero for the dummy item. And then we're gonna do this repeated matching. So in the first step, agent one is matched to item one, agent two to item five, because they, have, they both have a value of one and these items are allocated. So agent one gets one, agent two gets five. And then we repeat this. In the second step, agent one is matched to item two and agent two to item four. Notice that agent one has a higher value for item four, a value of one, but this matching of 0 0.8 plus 0 0.7 is the maximum weight matching. So that's what you're choosing. And then these items get allocated. So agent one gets one and two, agent two gets four and five. Similarly, we do this in the third round, agent three gets allocated to one and I mean item three and item six is just discarded because it was a dummy item. So our final allocation is agent one gets one, two, three, agent two gets four, five. This surprisingly simple allocation uh, actually solves their first conjecture, both of their conjectures for additive valuations. So our first lemma is that the allocation found by this algorithm is NB freeable. Um, so by our earlier theorem, we know that we want to show that there's no positive weight directed cycle in the NB graph. But the weight of any directed cycle in the final allocation is simply the sum of the weights in the NV graph of each round, right? So in each round, every agent gets exactly one item. So there's exactly N items that are allocated. So the, the sum of any, uh, any cycle's weight at the, I mean, sorry, the weight of any cycle in the final allocation is simply the sum of weights in each round. So if it's positive in the final allocation, there's some round in which it's positive. But if the cycle is positive in any round, then there's a matching of greater total weight. You just need to rotate the allocation on the cycle. So it's as simple as that. The allocation is NB freeable. We can also show the allocation is EF1. Um, so we denote by mu IT, the item matched to agent I in round T. So we know that for any pair of agents I and K, agent I's value for the item that it got in round T, mu IT, is at least agent I's value for the item agent K got in the next round T plus one, right? Because this, is, this item was available in round T. So if agent I had higher value for this item, agent I would have chosen that in the matching. And this is enough. So we have that uh, agent I's value for its entire bundle is the sum of values for each item. But VI of mu I1 is at least VI of mu K2. VI of mu I2 is at least VI of mu K3 and so on. So uh, agent I's value for its bundle is at least its value for K's bundle minus an item. But that's the definition of EF1. So with that very simple algorithm and two simple lemmas, we already resolved the second conjecture that there is an allocation that is NV variable in EF1. But now we want to show that the subsidy is at most $1 for this allocation. And that's a harder task. So we know from this lemma that the allocation is EF1. What does that mean? That means um, the weight on any arc is at most one, right? Since the weight on arc IK is the NV agent I has for agent K and the value of an, an item is at most one to any agent. Suppose as a thought experiment, instead of just having that the weight is at most one, we also had that the weight is at least minus one for every arc IK. If this were true, then it's a sufficient condition uh, because we're gonna show that if that's true, then the maximum subsidy required is at most one for agent. So I'm gonna do this by picture. If you had an arc IK with weight at least minus one, then for every path going from K back to I, the weight of the sum of weights on the path is at most one because you have no positive weight cycles. So if this is true for every arc, then the weight of every path is at most one. So the weight of the heaviest path starting at any agent is at most one and the subsidy to each agent is at most one. But what is the condition of this lemma say? It says that the weight of an arc is both at most one and at least minus one, but this is unrealistic. This means each agent is indifferent between the bundles. And for most instances, it's very unlikely that such an allocation even exists. But we can still use this lemma to help us because what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take our instance and our valuation function, and we're gonna modify the valuation function to construct a new instance with a modified valuation function. For that new instance, this property is satisfied so we can apply this lemma. Then we're gonna show that uh, the subsidy for the new instances can only be greater than the subsidy for the original instance. So we'll be done. So let V be the original valuation function. We're gonna show that we're gonna create a modified instance with valuation V bar and show that the same allocation output by our algorithm under V is still NV freeable under V bar. Then we're gonna show that the minimum payment is at most $1 per agent under V bar using the lemma from the previous page. And we're gonna show that for any agent, the minimum payment under V is at most the minimum payment under V bar. So this gives a bound of $1 under the original value is V. So this is our modified valuation function V bar. Uh, for any item uh, mu IT that agent I actually gets, you keep the value the same. So VI bar of mu IT is just VI of mu IT. For any item that some other agent K gets, VI bar of mu KT is um, the maximum of VI of mu KT 
and VI of mu i t plus one, the item that agent i gets in the next round. So if agent i particularly dislikes agent k's item from round t, we're going to artificially inflate the value until it's equal to agent i's item from round t plus one. And finally, for uh, all the items in the last round, we give the value of the same. So for this modified valuation function, we're going to show our result by the sequence of three claims. First claim is that the allocation output under the original valuation is still NV freeable under the modified valuation. Um, so suppose for the contradiction, this was not true, then there exists a cycle of positive weight under the modified valuation. As before, this means that there's a cycle of positive weight in some round T. So we're going to show that this is not possible because then the matching that, that we chose in round T under the original valuation is not maximal. In order to do this, we're going to look at the NV graph of the modified values V bar, and we're going to color an arc blue if the value did not change. So VI bar of mu KT is the same as VI of mu KT, and red if the value did change when we modified a valuation function. So VI bar of mu KT is strictly greater than VI of mu KT. In fact, it's equal to VI bar of mu I T plus one. All right, so consider the positive weight cycle C in the NV graph of round T. We're going to do this by example. If all of the arcs are blue, then we're done because we're just looking at the NV graph of the original valuation, at least for the purposes of this cycle. So we can simply reallocate the items by shifting them back by one agent along the cycle. And this gives us a, big, uh, a matching of greater weight, which is a contradiction. If instead we had some red arcs, then the cycle can be partitioned into a sequence of paths, each of which had, ends with exactly one red arc. So we have the path P1 ends in a red arc, the path P2, P3 and P4 in this example. And because the cycle has positive weight, there is a path that has positive weight among these paths. In this example, it's P2. So the sum of weights on T2 is positive. But now since the arc five, six is red, agent I, and so, so the value did change. So agent five prefers the item that agent five gets in the next round, mu five T plus one, under the original valuation to the item that agent six gets in round T. So we can simply give agent five the item, mu five T plus one, and then shift the items back by one agent along the, the blue path and we get a matching of greater total weight. So this is a contradiction. Now, the next claim is that for the NV variable allocation AV, the subsidy to each agent is at most one. So we wanna apply the lemma we had earlier. So we just wanna show that the weight of any arc is at least minus one. But the weight of any arc IK, if you just substitute VI bar by VI, by the definition of VI bar, we just get that the weight is minus one. This is easy to check. And even easier is to show that when you went from the original valuation function to the modified valuation function, uh, the subsidy can only weakly increase because um, any agent's value for its own bundle or its own items does not change, but its value for any other agent's items can only increase because we increase the value until it's at least as high as the, the, the item that agent I gets in the next round. So that tells us that the weight of any arc in the modified valuation graph is uh, at least the weight in the original valuation graph. And so the weight of any path is at least the weight of any path in the original valuations. And so this, the heaviest path is at least the weight of the heaviest path here and the subsidy can only increase. Uh, those three claims give us our main result, which is that for additive valuations, there's an NV variable allocation where the subsidy to each agent is at most $1. So at most N minus one in total, and this is tight. We also in the full paper studied the much more general problem of monotone valuations. And we show that there's, a, the, there's an instance where there's an allocation where the subsidy is at most two N minus $1 to each agent and therefore O of N squared. Uh, that's it. That's the end of my talk. Thank you.